We're almost done getting everything configured. We've got Flutter installed successfully. We see a couple of ways to use the Flutter VS Code extensions to run our app more conveniently. Now we're gonna get Firebase set up, which is going to be the engine behind all of our backend services to authenticate our users, to store our data, our files, etc. So we're gonna get all of this going before we actually create and get our starting code set up for our Flutter app. So in order to start working with Firebase, in order to set up a Firebase project, you want to head to firebase.google.com. You'll sign in with your Google account, and then you'll select the button Go to Console. So we'll be taken to our Firebase console, and we want to create a new Firebase project. So we'll select Add Project, and I'm going to be naming my project Flutter Share. So I'll provide that as the project name. Feel free to use whatever project name that you like. Then you'll select the terms and choose Create Project. And once our project's ready, we'll hit Continue. And we'll see once we have our starting code how to integrate Firebase with our Flutter app using the iOS integration and Android integrations to run it on both types of devices. But right now we're just gonna get all of the resources configured and we're gonna have just a high level overview of all the different tools that we'll be using within our Flutter app. So we're gonna be using the majority of the resources that Firebase makes available to us. You can see them all here on the left-hand side and we're gonna get started with authentication. So to authenticate our users, we're gonna be using social login. Namely, we're gonna be using Google sign in in the same fashion that we signed into Firebase. We're going to enable users to sign in with their Google account. So to set that up, we can choose set up sign in method and we're just gonna choose in the providers list, Google. So once that's opened up, we'll click enable and we have a couple of settings we can configure here. The first thing is the public facing name so when a user wants to sign in with Google, they'll be given a modal that tells the user the name of the app that they're signing into. So here we can put in the name of our app. Again, I'm going to use Fluttershare. Feel free to use whatever you want. And we also need to include our project support email. And note that we have these question marks here, this question mark icon that we can hover over, and that'll tell us more information about a ton of different things within the console. So make sure to make use of that we can see here that the project support email is presented to users when they authenticate with Google. So it's basically to associate a given email with our application. And we just want to select the one that we signed up with using our Google account. So once that's configured, and note that if you don't provide this support email, you're gonna get an error specifically if you run it in your iOS simulator or on an iOS device. So we've got those two things set up and we can hit save. We'll see how to do the full setup for Android, and that involves creating what's known as a SHA-1 figure, fingerprint, but we'll cover that in a later section. Now, moving on to our database, we're gonna be using the real-time database, Cloud Firestore. We have a couple of options here with Firebase. We can either use the real-time database, which is the original Firebase database, or we can use the Cloud Firestore, which I think has better queries, a more sensible way of structuring data for our database. It basically consists of what's known as collections and documents. But again, we'll get more into the concepts in a later step. Right now we just want to create it. So we'll select Create Database. We want to choose the option to Start in Test Mode to enable all reads and writes. This is gonna be helpful for development, not so great in production. It's going to enable any user using our app to read or write, read any piece of data or write, that is make any changes to our database that they like. What we can do, however, for production is we can set some rules where we can say, for example, that we want only a user that has created a given post to be able to edit that post, for example. But we can set those rules later on. Right now we'll just hit next and we can choose the location that we want our database to host our data in and for the data to be served to us and likely our users in the fastest manner possible, we want to choose the location that's closest to us. So I'll provide the area that's closest to me and I'll hit done. And once our database has been provisioned, we'll see the interface for working with our data, seeing data and changes. As I mentioned, it's a real-time database, so we will be able to see changes as they happen in real time, which is really neat, directly within this interface. You can start managing data right now. We don't have any at the moment, but you can 
add a collection. So if you want to start working with things and, and see how this works, how the, the Firestore database works, go right ahead. We'll cover the concepts behind it in a later video. You see a data tab here for working with our data. We see rules for setting up those rules that I mentioned, indexes for more performant querying to basically tell our database what types of queries will be performing in order to speed up the reads and optimize our database to get our data in a more efficient manner. So we've got our database set up. Now we'll move on to storage. And storage is going to be where we store all of our media files naturally. So we just want to choose Get Started to get that set up. Again, it includes some rules. So in a similar fashion to our database, we can configure how our different files are going to be read and updated. We'll select Next. We'll choose our location once again. It should automatically provide the previous location that you selected for your database. And we can just hit Done. And when our storage has been created, we see a number of things here. We can upload files manually, upload folders manually. We can also delete them. We see a URL associated with our bucket, our storage bucket. We can configure rules in the Rules tab with this JSON object. And finally, for functions, we're going to be using serverless functions, what's known as serverless functions, in order to tap into additional functionality from Firestore. But basically, we're going to be writing some backend code that we're going to deploy to a remote server. You can read more about it here, but in order to actually create it, to provision it and deploy it, we're going to be using the Firebase command line tools. So in order to set that up, you're going to need to have one thing, one additional thing installed on your computer, and that is Node.js. And that's basically just to have the package manager associated with Node called npm which we need in order to install this Firebase CLI, the Firebase tools, as it's called. So if you don't have Node, you'll need to go to nodejs.org. I'd recommend installing the long-term support version, which is version 10. So you can get the long-term support version. And in order to install the Firebase tools, once you have that, you can head to your terminal or command line, and you'll just run npm install dash dash global to install it globally on our computer. Firebase-tools. And depending on your permissions, you might need to run this as a super user, which involves prepending this command with sudo. And you'll provide your password. And when that's done running, you should see Firebase Tools and the version that was installed on your computer. So that's just a high-level overview of all of the different resources that we'll be using within the Firebase console. There's a ton to explore when it comes to using Firebase. Feel free to do some exploration on your own. And once you've followed all those instructions, we're ready to move on to the next step and actually get our project and our starting code brought in and begin working on our app.